Hello and good afternoon. Today is June 17th and it's 12.30. So we're going to get started because we want to be conscious of all those people who have joined us early today. And we have a very important group of panelists today that I'm sure are going to appreciate that we start an end of time because they're very VIPs, really. I feel very lucky to have them today. So today we're going to be celebrating Pride Month with this Pride Community Chat today. And I have to tell you that, you know, this is a very important topic and especially the fact that it's happening in June, you know, it brings us uh, at a, another celebration level. What we want to be discussing today is that there are not enough healthcare providers nationally to provide the full spectrum of health and wellness needs for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer patients. This community is disproportionately widening an already dangerous health equity gap. In Rogland County, we have very limited providers to address these needs and approximately 24% of LGBTQ plus people most travel outside of Rogland County for primary and specialty medical care that is safe and affirming for them as LGBTQ plus people. Transportation barriers and other social determinants of health often prevent LGBTQ plus people from receiving the essential and targeted health care they need and deserve as part of integral wellness. To discuss this important topic, we have top professionals today from a variety of organizations. They are experts in lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer healthcare, and they have been able to make a difference in the advancement of healthcare for this community. We're going to start introducing Ms. Christine Smooth Lowers. She has been the Chief Operations Officer at Talent North Community Health Centers since January 2014. With over 20 years of healthcare operational experience, Christine has been responsible for various aspects of administrative management, program development, community engagement, efforts, and regulatory compliance. During her time at Talent Lourdes, she has facilitated the opening of two expansion locations, Talent Lord Bronx in 2016, and most recently Talent Lord Brooklyn in March of 2020 transforming Callen Lord into a healthcare network providing LGBTQ plus competent care with sites in three boroughs across New York City. Dr. Peter Meacher is next. Dr. Peter Meacher is a family physician who has been treating HIV patients since coming to the US from the UK via Australia in 1995. He completed residency at Montefiore's RPSM during which time he became heavily involved in LGBT activism in the Bronx, getting a 100,000 New York State Department of Health grant in 1999, which launched an effort to connect Bronx residents with LGBT affirming medical providers. He has worked in uh, family qualified health centers since then and has been CMO at Calvin Lord since 2013 during which time he has worked to ensure minimal pharmaceutical entanglement with clinicians, introduce scripts for medical providers, flex care, which is an open access model of care. He consults and is a strong advocate for carefully embracing telehealth post pandemic. Dr. Barry Singman. Dr. Barry Singman is the Clinical Director of Infectious Diseases at the Moses Division of Montefiore Medical Center. He's also Medical Director of the Montefiore AIDS Center and Professor of Medicine at Albert Einstein College of Medicine. He has devoted his career to the care and prevention of infectious diseases, including HIV, Hep C, STDs, and most recently COVID-19. He has cared for people living with and at risk for HIV since his medical school days at NYU Bellevue in the early 80s, being part of every major advance in HIV care prevention and research since then. Most important to him throughout has been that people at risk for HIV and other infectious diseases be treated with dignity, equality, and compassion. 
His Bronx HIV and HIV prevention program, the Oval Center, is one of the largest in New York State and provides the highest quality comprehensive services to all. The Oval Center and Dr. Stigman's team have been honored with numerous recognitions for their services. Dr. Robbins Godlock is a family medicine physician and administrator at Northwell Health. He helped create the LGBTQIA plus health center of excellence in a sleepy hollow New York, where he practices full spectrum family medicine. Additionally, Dr. Godlock is the VP and Associate Medical Director at Phelps Hospital. Dr. Godlock lives with his husband and four children in Westchester, New York. Now we have the team from the Pride Center. We're very lucky to have them. And I have to say, we've been planning this whole event with them and I could not have done this without them. So we have Alex Francisco. Alex is the Director of Youth and Young Adult Services at the Brooklyn Pride Center. She is the founder of the Pride Center's Youth Programming, which creates a web of community care and healing for LGBTQ plus young people. From her time as a youth educator at GMHC to her work as a therapeutic beauty consultant, Alex brings decades of experience and wisdom in creative, creating holistic wellness for the community. Lauren, Lauren Klein, is the director of health and wellness at the Rockland Pride Center. He supports and advocates for community members in navigating healthcare and social services educates professionals on LGBTQ plus topics and holds transgender and non-binary community wisdom on surviving outside systems. Let me see, I think I went through all of your bios, uh, except for Brooke. And Brooke is the director of the Brooklyn Pride Center and she's going to be leading this discussion. Brooke, I'm not sure if you wanna tell us a little bit about the the Pride Center and a little bit about your work. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Alex is sorry that she cannot be here right now as we have a small staff and a very great need in Rockland County. She is out on an emergency with a young person who really needs her, but that's what we do. I think everybody on this uh, webinar understands what that's like, community first, always. I'm so glad to be with you all. So the Pride Center, which is now the Phyllis B. Frank Pride Center of Rockland County, is located in downtown Nyack, New York. Um, you can see our information, our phone number, and our um, email right there in the chat if you want to take a look. We serve the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, non-binary, queer, plus communities and our allies. Uh, we work with all ages. And uh, the major part of our work over the last few years has really been around health care. Um, the need for it, the absence of appropriate health care, and uh, how to make that better for LGBTQ plus people, uh, particularly our youth. So with that, um, Sandra, I guess we'll just jump into some questions. And we came up with these questions as these are the top priorities that we have heard from the LGBTQ plus community locally. So um, the first thing I would like to talk about today is transgender and non-binary health care. And uh, for Lauren, if you would just start us off uh, working with the trans and non-binary communities, um, and then I'm gonna look to uh, Dr. Zingman, Dr. Wasserman, uh, who I think they also could not be with us today, another emergency, but anybody else who wants to jump in on this. But Lauren, what, what, is the, what are you hearing from uh, the trans and the non-binary communities around uh, primary care and healthcare in general? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I thank you to everyone who's here today. Um, you know, I work with hundreds of trans and non-binary people every year and 90% of what they reach out for is related to medical care, um, whether it's access, whether it's a referral, whether they need some advocacy. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, locally here in Rockland, you know, we've had to, we've had a, not a great you know, uh, sort of field of options. We've we've had to rely on endocrinologists, which is not ideal. Um, we have to rely on therapist letters, um, which is, you know, not ideal, you know, and it, it creates a lot of barriers for people. Um, you know, I've had people tell me that their therapist required them to do like months or even years of counseling before they would 
would give them this letter that says they're competent to consent to medical care. Um, and, you know, it's, it's just really dehumanizing to have someone tell you, like, you're, you don't, we don't trust you to make decisions about your own body. Um, you know, other times it's maybe like a young person who's on their parents' insurance. And so, you know, getting the care they need is going to out them to their parents who are maybe not supportive. Um, you know, even just like here in Rockland, our transportation system is a real challenge. So, you know, even just like having cab fare to get to appointments, um, you know, it's, it's a barrier. It means people feel like kind of hopeless. Like I can't live my truth because I can't get to the doctor to get what I need. Um, you know, so, so a primary care provider, someone where it's like, I can build this trust with one person and then they're my person I go to for everything. You know, someone who is not going to like tell you to lose weight every time you come in, who trusts you to, to make decisions about your own body. That's, that makes a huge difference. Thank you so much, Lauren. So with that input, you know, from the greater community, uh, Dr. Zingman, like, what do you feel that the role of primary care provider is in trans and non-binary people's health care? Uh, yeah, thanks. And thanks for, uh, for hosting this, this session for the community. Uh, let, let me just say, uh, I, I think one fundamental principle is that uh, we in the healthcare system need to adjust ourselves for LGBTQ care it's not those individuals who are LGBTQ who need to adjust to us. Uh, that 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 is the only way that we're actually going to be successful. And so and so uh, we need to be able to offer uh, LGBTQ primary care that's comprehensive, that's local to where people are living or working, where they where they prefer to give care. Uh, certainly, the care needs to be given by professionals and support staff. Who are who are are trained and comfortable, and uh, and and can give it as part of comprehensive sexual health services, primary care services, HIV services, HIV prevention services, uh, and so that's something that that you know we have been progressively doing it on. If your medical center is training our staff and also creating sites of excellence in LGBTQ care. Uh, where where folks can come and feel and feel very comfortable, and uh, and so we have been and 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 you just you, you just don't take regular staff in a clinic and say all of a sudden after one training that they are LGBTQ competent. Uh, that's a process of training and sensitivity building over time, as well as attracting new staff who have it fundamental to their being. Uh, and so this is what we have tried to do over time. That's fantastic and such an important point. You're right. It's not just one training that, that, that will do that. Thank you, Dr. Zingman. And, you know, for the team at Callan Lorne and, and Dr. Gottluck, so do you, um, anybody want to speak to tips or educational resources for providers that are looking to move to an informed consent model for hormone care? Uh, could I uh, just say something for a minute? First of all, thank you for having me on the panel. Uh, this area is so important to me. I work here in Westchester and, and I see people coming from Rockland all the time and I'm delighted to see these patients, but I would love them to be seen in their own neighborhood by their own local doctor. And I, I, I hope for that day to come sooner than later. Uh, circling back to some of the questions, you know, when I, when I see kids in my office uh, who are trans or non-binary, uh, their number one complaint of the reason they're switching to me is because their doctor just didn't get it. They didn't understand the language they're using. They didn't understand how they described themselves. They didn't understand what care options were open. They'd miss big windows for pu puberty suppression or other things because they just didn't understand what was available. And so I think one of the big pushes is continuously Giving, uh, giving opportunities for our primary care doctors to learn about this. And, and even if they don't feel comfortable, uh, they should know who they can refer to, who would feel more comfortable. Uh, they just need to know about all these resources out here if, if they can't do it themselves. Uh, but hopefully they, they will be with time. Yeah, and uh, hi everyone again. Thank you for including us from Cal and Lord on the panel. It's uh, a delight to be here and much appreciated to have the opportunity. 
Um, I think maybe just to reinforce what we've been talking about, I remember so clearly one of my first sessions at Calendord when I uh, was, I saw two patients back to back. And the first patient was a 24 year old uh, trans guy from upstate New York. He traveled like three or four hours to come to us. Um, who was uh, looking to um, continue hormones. And uh, he had uh, finished college and uh, was planning to go to veterinary school and, you know, was just, was really, uh, had got everything together and it was just really exciting uh, to talk to him about his plans in life and what was going to happen. And um, uh, the next patient uh, was a 61 year old um, uh, trans woman who was coming to see me to start hormones. And shortly after I walked in the room, she just burst into tears because she was, her experience of sitting in the waiting room and seeing people, young people who were, you know, uh, being their true self uh, at the beginning of their adult lives um, was such a contrast to, to her story. You know, she had been uh, thrown out of her house by her parents when she was a teenager in Texas. She'd ended up uh, living on the streets for a long time. She'd never completed her education. She'd sort of bounced from job to job. She uh, had done sex work on and off for a long time. She'd become HIV positive. When I was seeing her, she was living in her car, you know, and it was just, wow, can you imagine this, this, and she was, I've got to know her over the years and, and, and she's actually uh, an amazing artist, you know, and I just start, imagined like how different her life could have been if she had, if the family doc in Texas had been able to support that family and her, um, in her, her gender identity, uh, you know, she would probably have had such a different life. And the contrast of those two stories, you know, sits with me um, so much because there is no reason being trans should mean anything other than uh, having a really full and healthy and wonderful life. And the fact that our health institutions so often fall short of our duty to enable that is, is really terrible and is something we should all be, you know, really committed to, to fixing. So I don't think that in any way really answered the question, but I just wanted to share the story. Um, it's always important to have that, you know, affirmation from doctors, from healthcare professionals like you all to really echo what we're hearing from the needs of the greater community. Um, so this is a very, really positive. Uh, Christine, I don't know if you want to add to that, but I certainly want to give you space. No, I, I won't add too much, but just to go back what Dr. Zeller said about making sure that staff are adequately trained and it's a affirming environment from an operational point of view really makes a difference. I think when a, when a patient comes into a health center, they should feel like it's an environment that is welcoming, inviting. We should certainly use pronouns. We should make sure that we have gender affirming bathrooms that are general neutral. So there's a lot of things I think from the clinical perspective in terms of making sure that we have adequately trained staff from the front door all the way to the clinical staff, but also making sure the environment is one that people that are already feeling marginalized in so many different ways are feeling affirmed when they walk into a facility. Thank you. 
I'm, I'll, I'll add just like something small, something that um, Ms. Smoot Lower said, um, just like kindness. Trans people so frequently are not met with kindness anywhere in life, let alone in a medical setting. It's something I see in everyone I work with. It's something I've experienced personally. Like, you know, it's a population that, you know, are maybe not getting like warmth and affirmation from anywhere. And so like, if the doctor's office can be the place, like if that's your slice of the pie that you have control over, like, let's do it. Like, let's put it there. You know, I'm seeing some really important um, comments, you know, in, in this chat right now that I don't want to uh, leave out. Um, you know, somebody said how we enter and this being the trans community, how we enter a space and how it affirms us is literally a matter of life or death for us. So just that walking in the door is what the trans and non-binary community has been telling us forever is that make it possible for me to come in here. Um, another question that we have is what sort of trans aware primary care is available in Westchester County? This person lives in Tarrytown or Eastern Rockland. I've looked for several years and have not found any. Um, the, the reactions uh, that they get is uh, they didn't cover it in medical school. I've been going to Cal and Lord because they're not only trans aware, I hope, but also they treat you like a human being, which doesn't seem to be the norm in other medical practices I've tried. So I want to just, you know, put that out there because it's important. It's the same echo of the same issue that we're hearing over and over again. And, and the comments keep coming, like how about services for LGBTQ plus interested in fertility treatments in Rockland or at least in Westchester. So maybe Dr. Godlock, if you can start thinking about that and give us some answers because you're, I guess, the closest we have here and same with Dr. Sigmund. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, some praises to Dr. Godlock's also uh, work that you're doing in your office and some um, praises also for the work Callan Lord is doing for some of the members of our community, so. Yeah, thank you for that. You know, <clears throat> in the chat, that person asked that question about uh, care in Westchester, and I think that speaks to the fact that outside of New York City, where there's, you know, wonderful places like Callan Lord, there just aren't a lot of options, uh, even in Westchester County, where I work, and, you know, this patient's in Terrytown, which is the sister community where I live and work in, in Sleepy Hollow, you know, we've created a, an LGBTQIA plus health center of excellence, uh, but it's hard to get the word out. So we, we see patients from all across Westchester County. I'm not, I'm not aware of any other out uh, um, advertised uh, center for the community. So, you know, we're happy to see that patient. It sounds like they already go into Cal and Lord and they have a great option, but there are now options up here in Westchester and uh, I hope my site can can be a good service to the community. We're getting other services up here. We do have a reproductive endocrinologist, uh, Dr. Bennett, who works uh, in Mount Kisco, who uh, sees our patients, and you know I, she's developing and uh, becoming someone who's uh, friendly to the community and understands the needs. She's um, helped many of our uh, LGB patients, and uh, I hope we can continue with with our trans and non-binary patients. Yeah, uh, let, let me add uh, that that in the northern Bronx, uh, which is close to Westchester, uh, uh, Montefiore Medical Center offers uh, LGBTQ care uh, to, at, at our, our Oval Center site, uh, at some sites of the Montefiore Medical Group, uh, and as well, we have a pediatric infectious disease doctor who sees patients at the Montefiore site in Hartsdale who gives uh, care to adolescents, in, including pubertal blockers. In addition, uh, and I don't know if this is an announcement or not, uh, but we, we are working with Montefiore Nyack and the Rockland Pride Center to develop an LGBTQ practice in Nyack uh, uh, based on the, the model of care at the Oval Center in the Bronx. So we're very, very looking forward to bringing LGBTQ affirming care to Rockland County. Yes, and having that community um, 
uh, having all of these uh, like anecdotal experiences and life experiences and, and stories from the community to help uh, inform, as well as what we know from our colleagues at Cal and Lord, and of course, Dr. Gottluck and other places really is uh, helps to inform what it is that is needed and where those gaps and services are. Because as Cal and Lord knows, not everybody can be sent there. I'm sure there's a long waiting list still. Um, it, it shouldn't be that. It should be that everybody is capable of, uh, of giving a general care to all people, in, uh, to all people, LGBTQ and otherwise. So with that, I'm going to move on to another uh, pressing topic that we certainly hear a lot about, and that uh, involves uh, HIV care, you know, for those who are living with HIV. Um, so Lauren, I know that Alex could not be here, and, and normally this is, um, this is her work, but what are some of the factors that you're hearing that support from the community that support or prevent people from being successful in their HIV treatment? Yeah, so um, when it comes to folks living with HIV, it's something that Alex and I work really closely on. Um, she speaks Spanish, I don't. Um, and that's like a, a big part of the population as well who are living with HIV. Um, you know, certainly it, it cuts across all demographics. Um, and, you know, something the people locally are saying is that, you know, there's like a lack of compassion and like genuine caring on the part of doctors and caseworkers. Um, there, you know, there are some really standout providers here in Rockland that everybody loves, um, you know, but it's a it's a big complicated beast that you sort of step into or you're sort of thrust into um you know caseworkers are like a huge part of someone's health care when they're living with hiv um you know and so like when there's like a lot of turnover in caseworkers, like maybe you love your doctor and you, your doctor's been there for 15 years and you've had a great relationship with them, but like your caseworker changes every year or every six months, you know, you rely on that caseworker to survive. They, they help you navigate access to insurance. Oh my God, this month, my medication is not covered. And so like, you know, the turnover in caseworkers and the, the burnout in caseworkers is, is a huge thing. Um, we could have a whole conversation about like enforced poverty, like people have to like maintain this like artificially low sort of income level to be able to access insurance in a lot of cases, which that's like a whole bigger topic that's like way bigger than today. Um, you know, but yeah, I'm trying to think of other things that Alex and I spoke about that she wanted really highlighted. Um, not shaming and stigmatizing. Um, empowering people with information. You know, there's there's a really different need from when you're first diagnosed where, you know, a lot of really sensitive questions have to be answered um, to, you know, when you're further along in your journey, like, what are my, what am, what am I facing, you know, long-term healthcare-wise? Um, you know, there's sort of multiple phases of the journey. Um, I'll speak about trans care like a slight bit, you know, having access to hormones as part of HIV care, like that's huge for trans people living with HIV. Um, I think when it comes to HIV prevention, we forget about trans men a lot of the time. Um, but yeah, biggest things are like compassion and empowerment. Thank you, Lauren. So, you know, there's two things that I really heard there is like how curious that each of your practices handle turnover and burnout amongst caseworkers. <sighs> as they're building those relationships. And um, actually maybe for Ms. Smoot Lowers, like from an organizational and resource perspective, how can a healthcare organization build in support around the social determinants of health? That's a really important question. And I'll ask um, Dr. Micha to jump in as well. You know, we really have tried to support our patient navigation programs and our case management teams in a very robust way. We know that the provider is one part of the team, but being able to really make those supportive departments a partner in the care planning for a patient is pivotal for any organization because the social determinants of health sometimes play just as big of a part of someone's care as their 
physical care that they're receiving from a doctor. So if someone has an issue that they don't have housing and they're homeless and they don't have resources, that really will affect the care. So really looking at that, I know we have been in talks to create additional divisions to, provi to provide additional support around housing as well. So there's a lot of resources I think an organization should um, really try to put into care planning and support in addition to the medical component of it. And then I'll defer to Peter. Yeah, to, you know, supporting everything you just said, Christine. But uh, interestingly, we, we now, in our quality program, we break down all of our data by uh, SOGI categories, SOGI being sexual orientation, gender identity. So whatever it is we're looking at, whether it's uncontrolled diabetics or unsuppressed viral loads in people living with HIV, we will break it down and see how, if it looks different amongst different groups. And one of the things that was very striking um, uh, that we, we found is that uh, when we're looking at our HIV positive patients, the rate of viral suppression amongst our TGMB identified patients was much less than the, the whole. Uh, we, we do very well with our viral suppression rates. Pre-pandemic, at least, it was sort of 90%. Um, but for our TGMB-identified patients, it was around 72 73%. So that's really important to know because the interventions that you design um, around you know, improving that number need to be really thoughtful of that and targeting, you know, thinking like what is going to uh, make the difference there. And, uh, you know, one of the things we, we have done that I'm extremely proud of, and uh, Sandra, you mentioned in my brief intro, is our FlexCare program. This is uh, a, a a program of, of what used to be called open access. So the idea being that not every, you know, our very rigid way of scheduling appointments doesn't work for everyone. You know, it, look, it works for me. I like to plan months ahead if I have a doctor's appointment so that it's in my calendar. I do not miss appointments, but that, that model doesn't work for a lot of people. And it's often because they have much more pressing and urgent things going on on the day of the appointment that just, you know, trumpet. So trumpet, I don't like saying that word so often. Um, <laughs> Thank you but, so uh, much, Dr. Meacher. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, so anyway, this open access, you know, people are seen without an appointment on their schedule. So it's a walk in thing, and we have seen an improvement in uh in in uh, uh, attendance and engagement in care through that dr zingman you certainly have decades of experience in hiv care and uh and as you were speaking before about your model of care at the oval center how do you approach things like uh, burnout um, for caseworkers, and you know most especially like educating patients in a compassionate way uh, sure. Thanks. Thanks for that. So, I, I mean, there isn't there, there isn't one key. Uh, it's a, basically a comprehensive package of things that go into providing comprehensive care, as well as maintaining staff satisfaction and trying to avoid burnout. In terms of comprehensive care, uh, so so we provide always try to offer primary care. Uh, to our individual living with HIV, hormonal care to our trans individuals, uh, every kind of care uh, to our HIV positive individuals so they truly have a, a health home. Then as well, we uh, identify as many staff as we can from affected communities. Uh, and that goes obviously a huge way in helping the people to feel comfortable uh, at the site of care. Another thing I would just say is that if, from a medical care perspective is that it really, frankly, is hard to dabble in HIV care. I think it's hard to dabble in trans care, obviously. You need to really know it. 
Uh, you need to be experienced with it. You need to be devoted to it. And, and if you are experienced and devoted, you will create an environment of care at your site that is the same. Uh, and so, so uh, and we need to build more of those kinds of sites and more bring more of those kinds of people in who are devoted to giving this kind of care. Uh, and, and let me just say, to provide that comprehensive care, unfortunately, insurance reimbursements don't, don't give us that. Uh, I mean, all of us who are giving care know that often we have to seek grants from New York City, from New York State, from the federal government. We get, we go out, we, we try to find every grant opportunity that's available to be able to fill out our case management staff, our patient educators, our patient navigators, uh, and, and, and other staff. And, and so I think, you know, in terms of avoiding burnout, we haven't actually found much burnout. Uh, and, I, and I think, at least in our, in our sites, because, because I think uh, we recruit people uh, from, from a point of interest that they really want to work with the, with the patients that we're caring for. They feel part of a, a really comprehensive and supportive team they, they really like coming to work. I mean, they really, they really do. They really like coming to work. They get a tremendous satisfaction from their colleagues, from their patients who are so happy to have to come into the site and be treated with respect and dignity and, and uh, you know, and like be treated as their, their true selves. So, so we, we don't really actually experience a lot of burnout. Uh, uh, our staff are really very, very satisfied. So I, I think it's a matter of doing all these things and just making a really good environment. Sounds like we can have a webinar on how to not keep, get staff from burning out, and you can lead that one, Dr. Zygman. That is a special but Thank you so much, Dr. Gottlock. I don't want to leave you out if you have any comments around HIV care. Uh, I, I would just say that uh, I would just echo Dr. Zygman's remarks that it's highly specialized now and uh, requires people who really know what they're doing. Uh, the, the question a lot of patients have to face is do they transfer all their care to an infectious disease doctor or stay with a primary care doctor. And those are things that I have to navigate. Uh, he may have some good sites that have infectious disease doctors that also do transgender non-binary care. Most sites don't. Uh, so I think most of our community uh, stays with their primary doctor and also gets HIV care outside of that. But uh, we need more resources in our area for that too. Thank you so much. Um, the next point is, and this is a, something, a call, right, Lauren, you would say we get on daily and not just one call, many inquiries, calls, people coming in, and that is really around uh, youth health care needs. So uh, once again, because Alex isn't here, but this is something we're all talking about as a team all the time. So Lauren, if you'd fill in, uh, what are the needs and barriers you're hearing about among the youth and young adult population that the Pride Center serves here? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so like, this is Alex's domain, like Brooke said, she's our Director of Youth and Young Adult Services. Um, but she and I work really closely, um, you know, particularly when it comes to medical care, I'm usually really involved with a young person's journey. Um, we serve about 100 young people at any one time um, here at the Pride Center. Um, and you know, the things that they are asking about when it comes to medical care and that like affect their lives, um, puberty suppression, PrEP, HIV testing, and hormones. Those are like the big four. Um, whether they are able to get access to those things is sort of a different question. You know, all of those things are like, they're life-saving. Like we, everyone on this panel knows that. And, and yet they're very time sensitive. As Dr. Gottlock alluded to earlier, like, you know, puberty suppression, PrEP, like those are very time sensitive. There's a window for those things to happen. And it's not like months from now when they've navigated all the barriers, um, you know, like there's a lack of providers, like particularly with, with puberty suppression, there's just such a lack of providers, you know, um, they, they may be far away. Um, I've definitely met with some providers who uh, are very nice and very dedicated and and yet erect all these barriers, you know, months of, of therapy, um, some really invasive physical examinations of a young person's private body parts um, before they're willing to start 
a young person on this, you know, totally safe and reversible type of medical care. Um, you know, in a larger way, I think like lack of awareness and education for young people is huge. They just don't know what their options are. Um, insurance is a big one, like insurance outing them to their parents. That's like a big barrier for a lot of young people. Um, yeah, particularly when it comes to prep, like we have so many young people that were like, let's talk about prep. You should think about prep. We all have everyone in this room, like in this virtual room. If you're sexually active, you should be thinking about prep. But it's hard. There's lots of barriers, particularly for those folks that are under 18. Um, yeah, so I'm looking forward to everyone's uh, thoughts and, and insights on that. Thank you so much, Lauren. So let's start with this. Like, how do you navigate health care with youth who don't have family support? Anyone can jump in. Uh, I'll, I'll just add a few things. Uh, first of all, you know, to our youth's credit, uh, I find them to be uh, very good at getting information nowadays. You know, they're, they're very good about going and finding online resources, online chat groups, forums. Uh, when they come to see me, they know so much. Uh, they, it's rare that I get someone who just doesn't know anything and I have to explain things to. Uh, so kudos to our youth for being so scrappy and independent to do this, despite the huge failures of our healthcare system and, and our society. Uh, and I think nowadays we have more tools for them to do that independently. Uh, when they do come in, I think it's very hard. If they don't have parental consent, uh, I, I find for many of them, it's just not even a, uh, it's a non-starter. It's, it's very hard for them to access the care they need and they uh, miss all of these different milestones and, and opportunities. And uh, I don't even pretend to have answers to, to that besides creating structures to support them. I agree. I think parental consent is certainly a major challenge, but similar to what Dr. Godluck said, I think many of our youth are coming in to our site. We have a health outreach to teens program and we have our mobile medical unit. And what we try to do is really meet the teens where they're at, you know, with our mobile medical unit, really going to sites to be able to to engage in care. There are so many barriers. There may be barriers at time about whether or not you're gonna be outed, whether or not this healthcare provider will have the knowledge to be able to um, provide care for you. And a lot of times um, critical areas, whether that's um, just regular GYN checks, STI treatment and things like that, go without treatment because there's a lack of knowledge in the community. So as much as you do have some that are very knowledgeable, there are some barriers, you know, to care for our youth. You know, some of the issues are really the mental health needs, you know, the social determinants. You know, if you are um, in a situation where you do not have parental support and you don't have other adults around you that are supporting you in this process, it becomes very dis difficult housing instability as well. So it is the issues around healthcare, but again, it's all those other components that make accessing healthcare even more difficult. So having the, the, the HOT program, utilizing our MMU van, and then within our, our HOT program on site, using kind of um, community members as well to get out the word to the youth about the services and how affirming it is and how you can come in and receive services, some services based on on your minor rights and without parental consent as well. Thank you so much. That is so important. And as we move to Dr. Zengman and, and Dr. Meacher uh, around what it means for youth is that particularly right now when we see that uh, trans youth are under attack on a national level, um, could you, you know, speak about the life-saving role of puberty suppression in a young person's health care? I think there's a lot of misinformation out there. I would have to defer to others. I'm not a pediatric provider, uh, so I don't want to uh, misspeak. Uh, we do we do provide it from pediatric trained uh, and fa and and family nurse practitioners in our clinics, but I, I I don't have direct experience with that, so I'll defer to others. Well, I will say that our youth programming has really changed, though, even in the time that I've been at Calendor, in that. 
originally our programming was really almost exclusively uh, outreaching to street youth and uh, now it's much more common to see uh, uh, adolescents with their parents in the waiting room and uh, uh, you know, there's a real mixture of people we're seeing, which has meant we've had to think, and, and maybe Christine will talk about that, about the, the sort of structural setup for the program, because we are seeing both, um, you know, housed and uh, housed youth who live with their family who are supportive, as well as the polar opposite of, of kids who've been thrown out of home, who are living on the street. And um, uh, paradoxically, it's often the, uh, the kids who are actually in the foster system who end up being the ones who can access puberty blocking because the fostering system in general is you know, following um, guidelines and supportive of uh, such interventions. Um, so it's, our, our, our program has moved from a sort of very focused place um, to a much broader umbrella of who we're serving, which has meant we have uh, started to do puberty blocking um, in a limited way, but you know, what always concerns me is how do we make sure we're not, we're doing things in a way that doesn't make um, uh, health disparity worse. So it's only certain pockets of individuals who are getting access to treatments and others are not just based on um, social determinants of health. So, but Christine, I don't know if you want to add anything about that change that we've seen. No, thank you for mentioning that, Peter. And I think we've seen, as you mentioned, we've seen the evolution. So initially in our waiting rooms, we had them blocked off from the adult um, medical side and we had separate entrances for our youth because we felt the populations need to be very separated. But as we've seen the evolution of families and as we are remodeling our spaces, we're really trying to make the waiting areas more inclusive. Um, and more comfortable space, not just for youth, but youth and families. So we've incorporated a lot of that thought process as we are redesigning our, our spaces so that we are really meeting the needs of youth and families at the same time. That's wonderful, just, thank you. Oh, I actually have a, a comment on uh, what Dr. Meacher had shared about uh, youth in foster care um, and in state custody in general. Um, I think that the idea that youth, that trans and non-binary youth are getting proper medical care in foster care, I think that may be a, a New York City thing. Um, on a statewide level, we actually are seeing that uh, foster care systems and other youth uh, custody systems are, are not providing access to this care. They're, they're deprioritizing it or they, they don't understand why it's important and so they they don't make, they don't take a lot of effort or put a lot of priority on, on getting access to it. So um, from a New York City perspective, the work is amazing. There's, it's going good, but on the statewide level, we definitely have more work to do in that area. Well, I, I don't want to have misstated anything. I, I, I guess what I'm saying is that the individuals who come to us from the foster system with, um, you know, they, that it goes very easily. The question of who doesn't get to us from the foster system is, I think what you're speaking to, a much bigger issue. So yeah, on the microcosm of the people who we see in the clinic, the ones who present with their foster parents from the foster system, that seems to be a very straightforward and easy point of entry. But I think your point is there are many people in the foster system who, who that is not their experience. So I'm not sure it's so different between New York City and state. But so thanks for that clarification. 
Yeah, and I think it's really just important in general around advocacy. So we know at the Pride Center that we are working with uh, attorneys and people in the family court system and those that work in foster care to understand why this is a priority, right? So it's really around education and what people have experience in and really know. So working with Montefiore as, as the Pride Center and with our family courts and foster care system, we're hoping to be able to change that and uh, and uh, use uh, New York City as that model. Sorry, go ahead, Dr. Zingman. Yeah, no, I just wanted to raise, thank you, thank you. I just wanted to raise just something else that I think uh, may be very obvious to everybody here, but is a, is a real optimistic potential future, and that's using telemedicine uh, in the future to be able to give greater access to LGBTQ care uh, to a wider range of individuals uh, without as many geographical concerns. Uh, so, so we do need to really push out our services uh, using telemedicine, maybe initial visits, intermittent visits, but we really need to, uh, I think the LGBTQ population particularly would benefit from a lot of, from telemedicine services, uh, and particularly with some of these very specialized, uh, relatively difficult to access services. So I would say that, that, that is certainly, that's a big part of our, of our expected growth over the next few years. I'm just interested to ask at the sites that have, are represented here, have you seen a large um, interest from the youth population with telehealth? I know for us, there are some issues that have been brought up about spaces for confidential visits. And you know, how are they, they may have the devices, but the opportunity and the spaces to be able to take those visits um, seem to be challenging. Um, so I just wanted to know, have you had success and were there any significant barriers? Um, that were noted by the youth population. Yeah, so I wasn't referring specifically to youth only. Uh, I was referring in, in in general. But yes, we have we have had success uh, with with youth, but but we don't see a, a real lot of youth. Uh, so uh, certainly the numbers are dominated by older individuals, uh, you know, and young adults, adults, and uh, and who you know who are incredibly embracing telemedicine, both for basically every, every single thing we've talked about, uh, whether it's e even STI evaluations, as long as they come in to get the, the lab test done, certainly for PrEP, uh, certainly for HIV care, certainly for horm hormonal care. Christine, thank you for bringing that up. You know, as, as especially uh, over COVID, when so much, everything pretty much went to telehealth, unless you had to really see somebody in person, uh, we saw an uptick across all ages of providing a safe space here at the Pride Center for people to have their mental health, telehealth uh, visits and other things. So we do here provide a private office and space to do that. And if they need an advocate with them, uh, particularly for young people that just wanna understand the right question to ask or like any of us might need during a um, healthcare visit. So I, we would encourage all agencies, no matter how you see young people in particular, or, or anybody that might not have a safe space to talk about something to provide that, that people can have uh, that to speak to a healthcare provider. So yes, thank you for bringing up that really critical need. Thank you, um, uh, and as a, our final question for today, I mean, we, we really could go on and on about so many of these topics and certainly I know Warren and I always want to, we could talk about it all day long. Um, but another of the top priorities that we're getting here in Rockland and surrounding counties is around cancer screening for LGBTQ plus people. So uh, Lauren, like while working with the community, what are the barriers people are experiencing in getting appropriate cancer screening? Yeah, um, so like I said, I work with hundreds of people a year and I can count on one hand the number of times cancer screening comes up. Um, and usually it's to tell me about like some horrific thing that happened to them while they were having a mammogram or they need a pap smear and it was like so traumatic. Um, you know, so what it's telling me along with, you know, reading the medical literature is like, we're not getting our, our cancer screenings. The LGBTQ plus community, like we're just, we're not getting our cancer screenings for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, certainly the trans community, but the cisgender bi and lesbian community also are are just not able to access um, appropriate cancer screenings and i think part of it comes from like having a lot of trauma 
from medical providers. I, I cer certainly in the trans community, that is widespread. Um, you know, it's, and it's like, it's more than just finding like that person with the rainbow sticker on their window, you know, is this person prepared to like speak respectfully about our body parts? Um, you know, are they like, I learned this at a conference, like you can do prostate exams in the lithotomy position to be more gender affirming for trans women. Um, so for the medical providers in the room, that means something for the people that are not medical providers, maybe Google it. But like, you know, there's all these ways that things can be more affirming, but like, it just seems like a lot of our, our providers, you know, certainly breast and chest health, it, things are, are lagging behind, um, you know, pelvic care is a little better. There's some people that are doing a good job, like, you know, but like, there's also just like sometimes really long waiting lists for that type of care. Um, you know, the, there's just a lot of barriers and, um, and like at the same time, like stress and oppression, the, the research is showing like that is a risk factor for cancer, for, for other medical conditions. So it's just like this perfect storm of like disparities and barriers and like need, you know? Absolutely, Lauren. So I want to bring out first to the panel, can anybody speak to the role of minority stress, as it's called, in someone's cancer risk profile? I mean, I can speak to indirect ways. It's certainly related. It doesn't mean it's not directly related, but I just don't know of any uh, data about that. But if you think about things like smoking, you know, that is a huge risk factor for so many cancers. And we know the smoking rates in LGBT people is much higher than the population as a whole so uh, and that's because of stress it's not because there's something inherent about being lgbt that makes you smoke although the tobacco companies have a lot to do with that as well because they target lgbt people specifically um, however so that's a sort of indirect example the uh the other ways I think uh, that Lauren alluded to are more about the uh, lateness of screening and the, the lateness of diagnosis. So not much, so much an increased incidence, but a later um, uh, detection. And also things like hepatitis C, hepatitis B, you know, come with uh, different cancer risks too. So I think there are lots of indirect ways um, stress is related to cancer that we've got good evidence for. Um, I'm not aware of a direct correlation that's been measured. Yeah, and I was going to uh, say the same thing as uh, as Peter just said about certainly about smoking and and the drivers of smoking uh, certainly being associated with with uh, throat cancer, esophageal cancer, stomach cancer lung cancer, colon cancer. I mean, it is such a driver of cancer risk. And, uh, and, uh, and as well, I mean, let's just also point out that uh, there does seem to be earlier cancer occurring, earlier occurrences of colon cancer occurring uh, across the United States and particularly in African-Americans. Uh, and, and, and gladly this year, uh, the, the age cutoff for colonoscopy screening has now been lowered. Uh, and so that's, that's, that's been something we've been asking for for years. And the same is true with HIV positive individuals. HIV positive individuals are at greater risk of earlier cancers, earlier colon cancer, earlier lung cancer, earlier cancer of many kinds. Uh, and so screening has needed to been earlier in those folks. Now it's not, it's not directly related to minority stress as far as I know, uh, but 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 many of our populations that we're talking about here are at greater risk for cancer and and fall out of the the it, it, the 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 previously established age norms uh, and so therefore sometimes are diagnosed late 
because they weren't screened. And you know, and just one and one thing as well is that uh, I mean, you really want to go to an LGBTQ affirming medical practice because because they're pretty much the only ones who know about anal pap smears. Uh, uh, like nobody else does them. Uh, anal pap smears are very important, uh, and uh, you know, in recognition of 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 of, of other HPV related cancers, uh, you know, of the genitals, of the mouth, uh, very, very important that that somebody who's not as attuned to this just won't be able to recognize. I, I wanted to um, follow up with those comments. You know, when we're screening for cancers, the cancers we're screening for are usually very intimate, right? We're talking about people's chest, we're talking about genital areas. Uh, so it's hard enough for anybody to do it, but then, you know, picture our transgender, uh, non-binary community trying to go to a doctor who doesn't understand them, doesn't know how to talk about these parts. It becomes monumental for them. Uh, you know, there are innovative ways we can, we can help this along uh, for cervical cancer screening. You know, there are ways that patients can do self-swabs uh, to test for HPV. Uh, they don't need to be medicalized and have uh, speculum or other probes put in. So, you know, I think we need to, as providers, come up with models that we feel comfortable with that can meet our community where they need it and decrease this fear uh, that, that our patients understandably have. Uh, and I think that can increase our, our screening rates and really help these populations. Uh, one other yeah. thing that we mentioned HPV, you know, a lot of providers don't know that we can give that HPV vaccine Gardasil up through age 45 now. And so our communities, I think, are at much higher risk. And those are discussions that doctors aren't having with our, our patients that are, you know, transgender, non-binary, or the whole LGBT spectrum. And uh, that's, again, where education can come in and, and make an impact in these people's lives. Great yeah, point. Can, Great point. Yeah. If I can just add to our uh, electronic medical records are not helping us here. You know, we need to have... EHRs that have organ inventories and are not in this sort of binary gender mode um, because uh, we've all figured out how to work around these issues. But um, what is lost is all of the easy triggers that should be flashing up in front of us on the screen, you know, boom, overdue for this screening, overdue for this screening, you know, that we, we don't get any of those because our systems are constructed in a way that is, uh, does not take into account people of different uh, gender identities. Um, so we need, uh, I would love there to be a system that assumes nothing and is populated with uh, 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 an organ inventory, which is used to trigger these reminders. I also, um, you know, the, the intersections of the community, like, like what Dr. Meacher was saying about the electronic medical record systems, you know, there's also some like medical racism that's that's baked into these systems sometimes. I mean, it depends on manufacturer and, and who's doing what, but like there's been some interesting, you know, information coming out about like, you know, who gets screened when and, you know, thresholds for different things that, you know, turns out when you sort of peel back the layers, they're, they're making some assumptions based on, you know, data that's just like from not, um, well-designed studies that are, you know, making assumptions about how different people's bodies function. Thank you so much for that. Um, yeah, there, there is a lot. And I think uh, as a common thread throughout this entire conversation today is we're talking about what outreach looks like, who's doing the outreach. You know, there are a lot of, uh, uh, community members that talk to others, whether it's young people, whether it's Alex that's talking to young people about things that maybe they've Googled but need to get into a little bit more, understanding how to connect those pieces. So we are really happy to be able to connect the LGBTQ community that come to us for, you know, uh, things around uh, healthcare and general wellness to affirming doctors. And we are so appreciative 
of everybody on this panel for um, having these conversations, just having somebody to be able to talk to, to say, yeah, there's ways to figure this out, um, whether, you know, it's around electronic medical records um, or, or a self-test at home and other places. Um, and then also I want to go back to, again, the affirmation that not just one training is going to make somebody LGBTQ uh, competent. Really, it's about um, investing in the idea that LGBTQ plus people that we are human beings and deserve the same level of, of health care as, as everybody else. Um, so prioritizing that. Um, I appreciate all of you for doing that. And uh, Montes, you are NIAC, uh, our uh, home hospital here that's just a few blocks away, uh, really stepping up and Dr. Geller, the CEO of understanding when we first went to them that there's a disparity in care and we cannot only rely on New York City. How do we do this here? How do we do this here at home for the people? And we are just uh, so thankful for that bold move of saying, yep, it's time to figure that out for residents here. So with that, I'm going to turn that back to Montefiore Nyack. Thank you, Brooke, and thank you to all of our panelists for a very interesting discussion. We know that, you know, there are a lot of social determinants of health. We know there is not enough health care, but at least we know that it's a, a lot of us who are very concerned that we want to make a difference for the LGBTQ community. So is um, our president and CEO, Dr. Mark Geller who is going to be joining us with some last words to, to close this event. So Dr. Mark Geller has been a resident of Rockland County since 1963. He and his wife, Trish, raised their family in their community and are, are active in numerous civic and charitable, charitable activities. In 2015, Dr. Geller was appointed president and CEO of Montefiore Nyack Hospital. Under, under his leadership, the hospital has made tremendous progress working with all segments of the community to provide the most personal and appropriate medical care to all. Beginning in 2016, Montefiore Nyack Hospital embarked on an ambitious goal of providing cultural diversity training to its staff. One of the most successful programs was geared towards our LGBTQ plus community and was a combination of newly introduced online annual educational sessions required of all staff members from all departments, including medical professionals, direct patient care associates, as well as in-person training sessions offered to all staff members in partnership with representatives from the Pride Center in Rockland. So, Dr. Geller, I'm going to ask you to unmute. Can you hear me, Sandra? Yes. Okay, I think my video is, has been, um, it's actually not working. Maybe it's on your end. You can uh, enable it. But if not, probably I'm better off. Um, but I just want to thank uh, Sandra and Brooke and Lauren for bringing this excellent uh, panel discussion uh, to the fore. Uh, I know it's helped inform me. Uh, on my journey to help provide uh, health care uh, to the community. Um, and apropos of an item that Lauren brought up relating barriers and uh, an item Dr. Gottluck brought, uh, brought up uh, regarding access, uh, we are um, in the process and should, um, before the end of the year, be uh, opening a comprehensive health care center uh, for the LGBTQ community in Rockland County in partnership with the Rockland Pride Center and in partnership with the Oval Center at Montefiore and Dr. Zingman and his team to offer safe, confidential, patient-centered, non-judgmental non uh, care to the community. Um, it's, it's something we've talked about for a long time. It's well past uh, time that it be uh, available to our community. Uh, and uh, we're very close to opening it and it should be open shortly. Uh, but again, I learn every day, and I think this panel discussion and the panelists uh, have helped inform me uh, more about what we need to do here. Uh, and I just want to thank you all for participating uh, and helping us uh, advance our knowledge and, and our understanding and our uh, ability to be empathic to uh, the needs of the community. So thank you all very much.
and thanks thank, everyone and thank you dr geller for participating i'm sorry the video didn't work i'm not sure what happened but uh you know thank you and thank you for all the efforts that you're doing as well here in monte Fiorna to better serve our community in Auckland. i think it's an amazing job that you're doing same with all the members of the uh, leading team in Monte Fiornaya. Thank you so much to Brooke and Lauren in the Pride Center. Please say hi to Alex. I'm, I'm sure her voice was heard through Lauren. So thank you so much. Christine, Dr. Meacher, as always a pleasure to see you. Dr. Singman, we will continue working together. And Dr. Godlove, thank you for being such a leader in our community. With this, we finish our event today. Have a very happy Pride Month, and I will see you next uh, Thursday. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye.